Well, hello there and welcome to Travels with Jordy. If this is your first visit, my name is Peter Knowles and I live on this classic wooden motor cruiser currently here in Vancouver, British Columbia, along the loving memory of my pup Jordy, all the while fixing it up for some pretty ambitious cruising. If that's the sort of thing that you might find interesting, please consider sticking around and subscribing. I'd love to have you. Notice anything different? <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, we had quite a blow in here the other night, and I mean quite a blow for Falls Creek. Anyway, um, the canopy structure survived just fine, but the cloth completely shredded. Happily, every single piece of it uh, was still attached to the woodwork, so I didn't lose anything, uh, but um, it was time to take that all down, at least for the season. As some of you will remember, I have talked about a new canopy for next year, so this is very opportune. All right, so we're gonna jump back to some woodworking in the cockpit. I'll explain it all to you in just a minute, but before that, I'd like to send a big thanks to my uh, PayPal and Patreon supporters. Uh, it's your support that keep the show going. Thank you ever so much. Let's get to it. The cockpit. It's time to deal with the cockpit, and there's more than a few problems. For those of you who've been watching a while, you'll remember that a lot has gone on in here already. Uh, let me give you a quick tour. Okay, for those of you who've been following along since the very beginning, you might remember when I bought the boat, the cockpit was basically a fiberglass bowl. The entire thing had been fiberglass, all here, 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 and it had a fiberglass sole in it with a couple of hatches to completely inconvenient locations, no thwarts, and this bulkhead was completely fiberglassed and the plywood inside was completely rotten. So. Some years ago, I rebuilt the bulkhead and added this mahogany planking. It looks 100 years old, but it's only a few years old. That's because I have abused it. New door, which I've refinished twice already, and it needs some oil before the, uh, needs some varnish before this oil on it lets go. Um, built the thwarts a couple of years later, but never really finished them, and I'll show you all about that in a minute, which is the bulk of the topic of this discussion. At the time I did all that work, I actually put some water tanks, I rearranged the tanks in the, in the uh, underneath the sole here. Forward is a 60 gallon holding tank, and aft is a 60 gallon water tank. They're relatively good tanks, and they're relatively well installed, but I know I'm going to have to take all of this out again in the next couple of years to do the structural work that I need to do to the boat underneath here the same as I've done forward so all of this is gonna to have to come out again sometime in the next little while and I keep trying to imagine some clever way to be able to do that without taking too much apart but that's really just allowed me to stall so what I really need to do mostly what I need to do is get some varnish on all this mahogany before this next winter completely destroys it and I end up with this problem again so how much work am I actually going to be able to get done to advance the cockpit just really to get the varnish on? One of the main things I really need to do is deal with the lazarette hatches and I'll show you why. So these lockers are actually relatively clever. Basically the sole stops at the face of them so that the lazarette lockers actually go down into the bottom of the bilge making them really quite large so the idea was that this center section would hinge up and if you see this back panel here the hinge is going to be actually at the top of it so it can swing out and up and clear the edge of the combing here so that all worked out pretty well to try and keep fresh water out of the bilge, I had actually designed it so that there would be a gutter underneath the two seams here that would drain out, very much like the very deep uh, and effective gutter does on a modern-ish sailboat. Uh, so that required having a small section at the front that doesn't open that can be sealed well to the bulkhead and a section at the back that doesn't open that can be sealed uh, to the transman all. All of that sounds great, except that's where I stopped. Currently to get into this lazarette involves this bit of gymnastics trying to balance this rather heavy chunk of mahogany assembly and then find a place to balance it somewhere. Well I tell you that gets old every time I want to get to the shore power cable. So I think this week is about getting the hinges on at least and everything finally trimmed up so that I don't, it's not sort of a temporary balanced in place mess anymore and it can actually be something that's relatively permanently installed. Notwithstanding how I'm going to take it apart when I have to redo underneath. I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. 
So as I mentioned, this is going to hinge on a piano hinge right along this very edge here. Well, okay, that sounds great. The only problem is, what am I going to attach the other side of the piano hinge to? There's sort of a void up in here. Well, I'm going to piece of, put a piece of wood in here that's going to go all the way across behind all three panels, or above all three panels. Why this isn't lined up, I, I don't know. I even bothered to notch it around that, and I, I, I'll deal with that. So, okay, so that piece of wood will go in there, and the piano hinge will go on it. Okay, now piano hinges are great, except they're really hard to attach in a confined space. Like, you obviously can't attach it while it's closed. Well, when I open this, it's still going to be a horrible place to try and get uh, screwdrivers in to attach all that. So this whole piece of wood here will be removable. Uh, as a result, it's got to be able to be affixed to another piece of wood in behind it, which is going to be the basic structure to hold this all. Let me let me draw you a picture. Okay then, so if this is the side of the combing coming down, and there's the inside of the hull. Basically that's that and back inside the hull. So here's my thwart coming in and up, and that's that riser piece on it. This is the part you sit on. Okay, so this is this gap I'm talking about right now. The piano hinge will go here. There's the actual barrel part of the hinge. So I need to put a piece of wood in here and then I have to be able to attach that to something else. Well, I'll put another piece of wood in here and that'll get screwed in up underneath the deck and this piece of wood will get screwed into this piece of wood so that during maintenance or assembly or anytime I have to modify it, it's these screws I remove which removes that upper little hinge piece and the thwart all in one and leaves the ledger permanently attached to the boat. That's the plan anyway. Let's see if I can pull it off. So I'll measure for the widest part of it, which is there about two and an eighth. Uh, here it has to drop under a piece of plywood that's a uh, structural gusset here, so I'll have to trim it around that. Anyway, two and an eighth, let's call it. So I made a little uh, scribe template uh, that is at the tallest point up here and uh, I'll use that to scribe onto here. Beer cases are so handy, I even get a little handle to hold it with. It's a little lumpy but it's gonna work just fine. And then right as we get to here, I have to notch down. And from here, it's lower. And the final trims are tipped over a bit because of course the side of the deck is tipped over a little bit. And well, there we go. That actually went an awful lot better than I feared it might. Okay, now to put the actual uh, hatch back in and make sure it aligns pretty well. Then I have to cut a little bit off the top of the hatch uh, back piece to account for the piano hinge. I knew this is going to involve installing and uninstalling this hatch a lot of times, but that's the price you pay. I don't expect it's going to fit under right off the bat. Oh, it's darn close though. Oh, oh, it's very nice. It's very, very nice. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> I was actually able to slide the hatch and its backboard in behind my new structure board so I can just scribe it, which will make this a lot easier. And if I scribe it on the flat, that'll leave me just about what I need for the piano hinge. And what I mean by scribing on the flat is that instead of angling the pencil so that the lead makes a mark close, I lay it flat and you'll see I get an extra, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and yes, yeah, so here's the piano hinge in question and I can confirm, yeah, about, about 3 sixteenths of an inch. Perfect. Okay, so if I get that roughly there somewhere and roughly here somewhere, and then I can fine tune it with my gauge. And if you've never seen me do this before, what I'm doing is I'm setting up a straight edge that I can use uh, as a guide uh, for the saw. And if you've been watching for any period of time, you'll remember that the magic number for that saw is in fact an inch and a half, which is an incredibly convenient size because inch and a half stuff is all over the place all the time. So we'll just slide that back up onto inch and a half at this end.
Now you might be wondering why I don't set up my spiffy workbench for this work. Well, in fact, it is sitting right there. Uh, the thing is, the work I'm doing is in the cockpit and to have this all set up here to work here would just wouldn't work, but I, I do miss it. While I was working upstairs on the helm, it just seemed simpler to carry on all the work up there rather than cart stuff back and forth. And I did have all that garden furniture. Okay, with that all ready to go, now I have to secure the big piece of wood that's gonna go behind that this is gonna screw to that will be attached to the underside of the deck. Enter this massive chump, uh, chunk of timber I've been carrying around all summer. And in fact, it's not a very good piece of wood. There's a lot of uh, gnarly grain in this end, so this could not be used uh, for anything particularly structural. Uh, this end is not too bad. Uh, so it's ideal for this because it's basically just gonna be a ledger, a very expensive ledger. <laughs> Okay, so let's rip a little strip off of this. This is a massive rip for a cordless saw. Let's go. Mm. There are some built up stresses in here because of this, all this gnarly grain. Uh, so it's already clamping on it. So it's much tighter here uh, in the kerf than the blade is wide. So you just have to back out and start again and back out and start again. It's gonna be a bit of a work. Closing up again, so I'm just gonna put a little wedge in it. Okay, so here's the upper hinge piece, which is what I'm calling it, and here's the support piece that I've just cut to put behind it. So basically, I'm gonna set this up so that there's enough material uh, exceeding the top that I can power plane it to follow this same curve in this direction and bevel in that direction. So let's just clamp this on. There, beauty. First I put a big splinter in my thumb. And mark off some nice pattern. We want the strong right, so let's say every six inches. Six, 12. Just so you know, you got the most beautiful sun shades I've ever seen in my life. Oh! <laughs> They're absolutely magnificent. Well, they're, they're controversial, I can tell you that. Oh, it's like all the Japanese junk about it, yet not quite. Yeah, know? something like that anyway. Good for you, you did a good job. Well, thank you. And let's make them all an inch from the bottom. Okay, don't need these anymore. Time to trim this down. Okay, so that is now absolutely flush, or <laughs> close enough for my first test anyway. And just because we're doing nice work, let's dress up the back of this. And well, I'm gonna chalk that up to luck. Uh, that fit perfectly the first time. I did make a mistake though. Uh, placing these an inch up is fine until I get to about here and then that screw, well, it's not gonna work anyway. Okay. I've put this in and out a dozen times today. Okay. So what I need to do now is absolutely finalize the location of this aft section so that I can I fix this upper hinge piece and I know that everything is going to stay in alignment. <laughs> yes, I do have a screw gun. Maybe it's time I dug it out. I just, I, I, whatever. All right, with it indexed, I pull the screws again. It's jammed up underneath this. There we go. And I'm putting a little uh, back splice piece on here uh, that will be able to attach the upper hinge panel to the back panel of the, to this. If you're gonna cut teeny tiny pieces of wood in half, 
screw it to a less teeny tiny piece of wood before you put the saw to it. There we go. There we go. And back. I'm sure this is going to come in and out about a thousand times in the next little while. And another backing block for the little end piece. There we go. Put it all back together. Here's a little future maintenance joy. I'll flip this hose camp around so that I'll actually be able to service it in the future. There we go. Hmm. Speaking of maintenance, how about a clamp for that vent? Okay, with that all fitting just fine, um, time to drill for the big screws I'm going to send up into the deck. Okay, perfectly flush, perfectly straight, perfectly flush. Time to put the big screws in. That is super, super solid. And now I can take the uh, upper hinge board off the structural <coughs> component there, and it should just pop right off of it, and off it comes. There we go. There we go. Now, that's great. That's solid and it's in the right place. This is all ready to go. Super happy we can get started putting the hinge on, but not quite, because the whole intent of having this upper hinge board is that the hinge will be pre-installed right onto here. It'll be super easy to do. Flip it back over and then slide this with the hatch into place. I currently can't do that because of the way this has to tuck up under here. All right, with a clever little notch here and a bit of an easing on top, it's now possible to roll this into place, which is absolutely essential because of course, it's gotta be able to go in and out while it's attached to the, uh, to the um, hatch. Okay, we're getting close, getting close. All right, so let's see how the hinge fits. Fits just about awesome. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I do have a small misalignment here. The lower hinge panel or the back of the uh, thwart uh, hatch here is actually leaning forward a little bit, but I have a solution for that. There's little tabs on the back where I'm going to put some uh, brackets to stiffen that up a bit. But on the whole, this is going to be awesome. Have a nice 90 degrees in here absolutely perfect okay so it is finally time <laughs> to install a piano hinge I absolutely can't wait so uh, it basically sits on there like that 
all we have to do is roll it over so it sits like that and lay the hinge across. The trick is lining it up. All right, so this step is ridiculously simple. We simply lay uh, the piano hinge across the two pieces of wood and uh, drill some screws magically. Some of you will remember this little sweetheart. This is a self-centering drill bit. In other words, it has a little spring-loaded chamfered outer collar. Very handy for, well, hinges. So basically, just set it up, lock it into your position here, and shoot right in there. And if I take you off your tripod, you can see that that hole is perfectly, perfectly, perfectly aligned. I like to populate it a little bit as I work, just to make sure that nothing is shifting. These screws are far too short for the final installation, but they'll do for now, because I'm going to have to take all this apart again to oil it and varnish it. Okay, down here. getting very close to the moment of truth. Let's see if I can actually roll this in the way I thought I was going to be able to. <laughs> and in! <laughs> I can! Fantastic! Okay, let's just tidy up a little for the big reveal. I'm assuming it's going to be a reveal. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I've been waiting to do this for about five years. Okay, folks. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I have working lazarette here. I know all of you do too, but this is new for me. Oh yeah, what do we need out here? Oh, what do I need? Oh, my shore power cable? No problem, I just grab it. Oh yeah, just shut that right back. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh gosh, that's just awesome. Oh, wait a second now. Yeah, well that'll be tomorrow. Oh, yeah. And hello and welcome to the Travels with Jordy Beer of the Week. Coming to you this week again from False Creek in Vancouver. This will be uh, my last Beer of the Week from False Creek as I head back across the strait to Vancouver Island uh, in, a, in a couple of days. Anyway, let's jump straight to the beer. This is super exciting for me. This is from Steel and Oak uh, here in Vancouver, um, or actually New Westminster to be fair. And it's a smoked Hefeweizen. Smoked Hefeweizen. I, I've never heard of one. I've never had one. This is actually something that's really, really interesting for me. So we'll see what we think of the steel and oak smoked half of Um <laughs> As you can see, or perhaps you can't see, but perhaps you can tell from the opening of this episode uh, and, uh, and uh, more recently that the canopy is no longer on the, um, the uh, upper... <laughs> Uh, upper deck of Jordy, and uh, I think I explained that uh, we had a really really big wind through here and it pretty much shredded it happily it didn't bother any of the structure but as I said I'm not even sure that structure will ever go back up again but I must say I, I do feel a tad exposed here now it's 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 sort of a different very very different feeling <laughs> without that above you and it's very much like when you're on like a terrace in a bar or something outside it's nice to feel something anyway enough about that all right, Steel and Oaks smoked Hefeweizen. Let's see what we think. Oh gosh, 
not at all what I was expecting. It doesn't taste smoked, but it does taste... I don't know what it tastes. It tastes really good. Um, maybe it's smoked. Anyway, I could drink it all day. It's fantastic. Okay, let's jump to the paperwork. Last week's winner of a Travels with Jordy um, t-shirt is Mad Dog 108. So Mad Dog 108, get a hold of me and uh, we'll make sure you get your Travels with Jordy t-shirt. Cheers. I'd like to thank a new patron that came aboard in the last week. And that's Tom Shoemaker. Tom, uh, thank you ever so much for coming aboard. I really appreciate it. Cheers. And some weeks ago off the Amazon wish list, a very kind gentleman um, sent me off the uh, Renergy DC to DC uh, charger, which I'm going to use to charge the dinghy battery. Um, uh, but I didn't have his name, but he got a hold of me and uh, let me know his name is Clayton Smith. Thank you ever... Thank you ever so much, Clayton Smith. And in, on top of that, Clayton also sent a, another of these fabulous uh, Blue Sea um, DC USB chargers. And these are so much better than your average uh, cheapo uh, USB charger because they'll charge at a much, much higher current, which is essential if you're running, say, an iPad at the helm. Uh, you, you need to be able to keep that iPad charged up because it uses a lot of power uh, when you're running it on GPS straight time. Anyway, just that aside, if you're planning on navigating with an iPad, make sure you have a high power charger for it. Enough said. Thanks again, Clayton, for all of those. This is really good, really good. I feel like a bird's gonna land on my head or something. Okay, anyway, all you need now is the now famous Travels with Jordy word of the week. And well, that word is going to be exposed. Do with it what you will.